Ernest, you are a pioneer of computer art, but you started as a mathematician. So first of all, I want to know how did you get to become a mathematician? So how did you study mathematics and how did you get into art afterwards? Okay, well, the truth is I got into art before. When I, and a, a quick story is that as a schoolboy, I was aged about 15, I became committed to art. And I also was good at mathematics and interested in it separately. And when I was 16, about to start my studies for the 16, 17, 18 year old period at school, I asked the school if I could study mathematics and art. And they said, no, you have to do mathematics and physics. So I argued about this quite a lot. And the head teacher came to a compromise. He said, well, we do evening classes for adults in art. I will give you free access to those classes if you will agree to do physics. <laughs> so I said, oh, OK. <laughs> so I studied art, but I didn't do it for an exam. And then when it came to leaving school, I talked with my friends who were slightly ahead of me uh, in age and had gone to art school. And I discovered that they weren't learning very much. They said to me, we learn how to clean brushes. Well, actually, that's important, but, you know, didn't seem a lot. So I decided to study mathematics, and which I because I found it easy, relatively speaking, I had plenty of time to paint. So at that time I was a painter, right? Just before computers, before I knew about computers. In fact, the university I studied in didn't have a computer, right? But I, it, fortunately, I came across uh, the opportunity to study philosophy as well and went into logic. So I really became a logician. Um, and then I had a job, the details don't matter, but I had a job in a different place doing this logic work. And I found that they had one computer in this institution. And I taught myself how to use it just for interest. Found I could use it to solve a logic problem. And then when I was struggling with a particular artwork in 1968, I realized that I could use the same method to solve my problem with my artwork. So I wrote a program to do it. This was 1968. So friends of mine in the art world, I was of course friends with people in the art world already, um, said, well, if you're using a computer, you should go to this exhibition in London called Cybernetic Serendipity, and you should join the Computer Art Society, and I did both of those things. And that's how it began. Okay, so uh, you already explained uh, what fascinated you by doing computer art, but maybe you can give a bit more, uh, uh, some more ideas uh, how you put logics into your computer art, maybe some more explanations about that subject sure well my painting was at that time my art making was moving very strongly into the constructivist tradition and i got to know as friends and colleagues british artists working in what was the, in britain called the systems art method so these were artists who were working in this constructivist tradition, mostly more or less completely abstract work, but often underpinned by the use of mathematics, geometry and other branches of mathematics um, to give it structure. And I always said, well, it was just like people in the earlier days used the perspective. It's the same idea, really. You just use these mathematical constructions to give structure to your artwork. and so I found that I could write computer programs that emulated some of this logical 
formal mathematics and I could write it about visual things. And so I started to ex explore this. So I think you are um, very, very close to Herbert. He, he had also friends in the constructive era, in the algorithm area. Uh, and he always con convin tried to convince them to use the computer to do that work. Uh, yes. But most yes. of them were very resistant. They didn't want and now they tell me uh, it took till 70s and 80s sometimes that they realized that uh, the computer would be a very nice tool for their work too. Uh, so they are very happy that uh, Herbert insisted uh, that he they should use a computer. I realized this, and that, that's an affinity that I feel very strongly. Um, I, there were two English artists who were really concerned with founding the systems group in the UK. Um, one of them was Geoffrey Steele, and the other one was Malcolm Hughes. And Geoffrey, in particular, had the same problem that Herbert had. He worked at a UK art department, and he tried to persuade them around the time that I'm talking that they ought to buy a computer for the artists. He didn't know how to use one, but he could see that it, it should be important. Um, but he couldn't persuade them. And he told me he did, didn't have the powers of persuasion. But then Malcolm Hughes got a job in postgraduate, uh, running postgraduate courses at the Slade School of Fine Art a little bit later. And he did persuade them, so they did buy one. And so I then started to work a lot with the Slade School of Fine Art uh, from where I am. So yes, as as far as I understand, um, you you do not see a difference between art and computer art. But I think uh, the traditional artists and also critics at that time saw a big different difference. Um, they didn't like that kind of art and said it is no art. So so how did you? Um, argue with them and and what were your experiences with this field of traditional artists and critics so of course of course i saw exactly yeah yeah I, i saw exactly that and it was a considerable problem well it still is in some places actually but it was a very big problem then and there was no persuading some people but the the very fortunate thing for me was I became friends and worked with many of these systems artists who were a strong group in the UK, uh, who, because of their background and interest in mathematics and so on, were sympathetic to computing. So I not unusually exhibited with them. So not an exhibition of computer art, but an exhibition of systems art, which included some of my computer-based work in the same spirit as what they were doing. So of course, this was not in central things. This was always sort of on the slight edge of the mainstream, but I didn't mind that because I think if you're pushing the boundaries, if you're advancing the subject, you probably are at the edges in whatever subject. So I, I didn't worry about that. Uh, and I just kept pursuing the work in this way. And in, in many ways, I was more interested in working with the artists who were painters but sympathetic than with all the other people using computers, some of whom I wasn't very sympathetic with their, what they were doing with computers. I didn't find it always so interesting. So when you, when you are looking back and you have an opinion now, do you see any difference in your opinion, how you looked onto computer art at that time? at the beginnings in the 60s, and you're looking to it now? Well, um, yes, mainly because I see additional things that I didn't see to start with. Um, and I can explain that briefly. So that it started with this interest in the computers to help with these structures beneath so that I could work with the underlying structures, equivalent to like inventing a new form of perspective or something and having the computer help me implement that or explore what the different possibilities were but because of the relatively rapid turnaround. But the other thing was that I did realize that communication through computers, networks, 
were interesting. So as early as 1971, I showed a networked art piece, not using the internet because we didn't have the internet, but it was a networked art piece. Um, and so I... May, may, I, I, may, I, I, may, I, may I ask a question what that meant? Uh, so how did it work? What meant a network art? It meant that in the very first example, I had six locations where six people, up to six people could be, and they were isolated from one another. They couldn't see one another, but they had a rays of switches and lights that could come on and off. And I connected them together with a logic-based uh, electronic network, okay, which I built, like, as I say, with a soldering iron rather than with software because of how early it was. It was before PCs or anything like that. Um, so what it meant was that what one person saw depended on what other people were doing. So, so it was an interactive piece? Interactive. It was one, it was interactive, and two, it was interactive in the sense of interacting with more than one person. And so the, the change is, because of the change of technology, we now have social media. I mean, after a, a while after this, but a long while ago now, we had the internet, and that started to make things different. Now we have a very sophisticated network system. So the idea uh, of the, the sort of things I do now, or well, one of the kinds of things I do now, which is networked art pieces across the globe, you know, connecting Europe with Australia or America or whatever, uh, so that the, the one artwork exists in several different places in the world. Uh, I sometimes call these pieces cities tango. It's like two different cities or three different cities dancing together. Um, well, it never occurred to me back in the 60s, 70s that we could would be able to do that, right? I was, um, and so this is a, a development, and I think it's an important direction um, in art to explore the implications of these new tools that we have available, this new medium that we have for our understanding of ourselves and of one another. How, how do you see the uh, fact that nowadays we have uh, a highly developed technology, you do not have to understand what's going on, you do not have to understand the logics, the mathematics behind the processes, you are just um, doing it and, and using it uh, and doing beautiful things. Uh, is, is, is that something you uh, you miss nowadays or say you that's or do you say that's the development and it's getting commodity or it is commodity and uh, you don't have to think about what's behind that well that's a <laughs> it's a very interesting and quite a deep question really because i think that what many people are doing using those software tools you might say is not making very interestingly new art. They're making the old art using easier tools. And that doesn't excite me very much. And the, I mean, I published this book a little while ago with uh, Margaret Bowden, which was about this whole field. And in it, I interviewed a selection of artists who wrote code, including young people and older people and talk with them about, under, if you like, understanding what's behind it. Um, and the reason that I really got committed to considering those issues was we did some studies with artists some quite some years ago, a few, a few of us, where we had artists in residence working with technologists Uh, and these artists often had not used computers before, but the technologists introduced them and so on. And one of the lessons we learned was that the tools that the technologists provided were never quite good enough. They always had to be modified somehow to do something that was interesting to the artist. And so I always think that the kinds of software tools and facilities and environments that are most helpful 
are ones where you can dig into them, possibly add a bit of computer software if you need to, and modify them and make them do things different to what the designer of the software package thought of in the first place. And if you think about it, artists are always using their media differently to how the people uh, who first produced them. I mean, I, an artist friend of mine used to use uh, stretch material, but that stretch material wasn't ever thought of to be used in artworks. It was thought of for much more mundane applications. And he did stuff with the stretch material that the designers of that material would never have thought of. And it's the same with software. And so I'm, I'm a little nervous about not knowing too much about it. I think that painters who paint in oil paint usually know quite a lot about oil paint. And it's not the same as painting in acrylic. You have to know different things. Um, it's a whole different game. And you kind of need to have to understand the medium, not maybe enough to make it, but enough to understand its properties in a fairly deep way. But but the, the, the uh, pure number of people doing work now is exploding because of it's so easy to use the systems. Yeah. Uh, it, they, the works might not be very um, um, futuristic, innovative, uh, but at least they are doing creative stuff, uh, yes. even if, if, if it's on a low ba ba level, I would say. Would, do you think that's something, it's a good development that the access to the making images and beautiful images, whatever this means, um, is open to anybody, even if he's not able to paint it by hand? Is that a good development or how do you see that? Yeah, so the difference between creativity and art. Well, uh, my colleague with whom I wrote that book, um, From Fingers to, to Digits, Margaret Bowden, had a classification of different kinds of creativity. And basically, uh, there's something which most people call everyday creativity, where something where something is created by somebody which is new for them so they're being creative they've never come across it before they've never thought about it before and it's new and therefore it's a, it's a creative thing and that's very important to most people in their lives i mean i think that one of the most important things that we have in life is being creative in one way or another um but then there's what she called H creative, which is historically creative. So that is like uh, in science, um, relativity theory or um, uh, or Newton's laws of physics, for example, or creating abstract expressionist paintings for the first time and so on and so forth. So these, and these are creative in much the same way, except they have a social dimension as well, that they are creative and they seem to be new by everybody else as well, right? And uh, both of these kinds of things are important, right? And when I chaired a committee for the British government um, a few decades ago, about the future of information technology computers for creativity in the country, that was in the UK. Um, we deliberately worked on several approaches to this, one of which was everyday creativity. How could we use this technology to help everyone be more creative? And in fact, the technology, the suppliers of the technology have themselves helped with this a lot. I see young kids making movies which are really quite sophisticated using the software that they have on their phones and so on. So that's everyday creativity is important as, as enhanced by our subject of computing. Um, and in a way, what artists are doing are exploring these things to push the boundaries of what that might 
mean? So by pushing the boundaries, I mean, they look at what everyone else has done. Most artists are pretty knowledgeable about the history of art. Go to the Louvre or the National Gallery in London or wherever and look at and experience art over the centuries and use that to measure about what they do. And usually they're trying to do something new-ish in some way or another. Often using new a new medium or new materials. And I see computing and particularly software in that light. It's really like a new medium. Uh, and so just by using it at all, we're pushing things forward. We were in the early days, at least. Um, and so, but as we do it, we actually move things forward in this age creative sense, but in doing so also make possible for other people to be more everyday creative using some of the things that people like Herbert and myself and others have involved, evolved. So um, I think Herbert and I were very much on the same page with this. Um, the way I've often put it is that the importance of computing in general, but especially for art, is conceptual rather than physical. It's not the computing machines, it's the concepts that go with it. So that in the history of computing, the people who have influenced me most have been people like Alan Turing, who did the theoretical conceptual developments, rather than the people who invented the bits of machinery that actually implemented those concepts. 